Yo, what's good? Let's talk Holyfield's bow. Their first fight was in 1992. And 1992 had two really good heavyweight bouts. One of them was Burt Cooper versus Michael Moore. Where Michael Moore won the WBL title. He was the first Southpaw ever to win a heavyweight title. That fight was so good. In fact, that's one of my underrated fights. But one fight surpassed that fight. As a heavyweight fight that year. And was fight of the year. Like I said. It was Holyfield Bow. This was Riddick Bow's first title shot. Uh, where he was going to prove himself to the world. And Holyfield was 28-0. But he was uh, old 28-0. He had fought um, Kawi, Michael Dokes, Burt Cooper, George Foreman, Larry Holmes. So he had already beaten legend. And pretty much established himself as a legend. Being a two-time undisputed champion in cruiserweight and in heavyweight. So, uh, like they say, we got a badass over here, right? Riddick Bow proved he was the real deal in this fight. This fight was went at a tremendous pace, and it went. It did go the 12-round decision, but it was a tremendous fight, and just Riddick Bow was such a good inside fighter that up. Holyfield was a smaller guy, right? But Holyfield, when he fought on the inside in this rivalry, that was the wrong fight for him to fight. And normally when you're fighting a big guy, you want to go on the inside, bang the body, you do the uh, go for it, uppercuts. But with Riddick Bo, since his inside game was so nice, he just shoot that uppercut so nicely from the inside. That he couldn't fight him on the inside. And that's what... I think that's why uh, Riddick Bo won this fight. And the, the, their 10th round was just spectacular. Of course, Riddick Bo hit Holyfield with the uppercut. And then a straight left that had that had Holyfield reeling onto the ropes. But then Holyfield comes back in typical Holyfield fashion. And great round, great round. That round could go either way. Uh, he gets dropped in round 11. He's drooling all over the place. But Holyfield still gets up. And Riddick Bow wins their first fight in 1992's fight of the year. This fight pretty much made Bo. And is why Bo is a Hall of Famer. This rivalry is pretty much why Riddick Bow is a Hall of Famer. That loss was so devastating for Holyfield that he was actually contemplated... Uh, I was going to say suicide. I'm sorry. He was actually contemplating retirement. He said, I I don't think I want to put on a glove for a while no more. He said that. And it seemed like he was going to retire. They were talking about, yeah, he had a nice run. And he gave such a good effort. Man, little did they know, man. He'd be fighting until he's 50. Second fight comes up a year later, 1993. Another great fight. And this is where Holyfield... Fought such a good fight and fought from the outside. Like I said before, you really don't want to fight from the outside, especially with against a guy with such a good jab like Riddick Bo. Except Riddick Bo didn't fight like a big man, at least not against Holyfield. He didn't he stuck out that jab a few times, but he bought it. And he had a really good jab. He could move. But he didn't really use it he didn't really do that he didn't really do all that against holyfield he wanted to fight him on the inside the uppercut that beautiful uppercut and holyfield timed the eagle jab and then he would land that straight right hand to have another classic one thing that stands out about the second fight is the seventh round yes they're duking it out and a guy flies in in a parachute with a big old fan strapped to his back this is what's called the fan man incident the fans quickly drag him into the fan into into the stands and start like beating him up. He said he got the fan man, James Miller, that's his name. He said he got punched like 20 times. <laughs> they actually took him to the hospital and then later he went to jail for the night and he went out on a $200 bail, so it wasn't too bad for him, but there was a 20 minute delay. A 20 minute a 20 minute delay because a man flew into the ring with a fan strapped to his back. <laughs> and the only reason he didn't fly right into the ring. Is because of the roof that the ring has. 
his parachute hit the roof and he kind of swung into the ropes. If not, he would have flown right into the ring, probably hit the referee or one of the fighters themselves and got beaten up by the fighters. But that that ultimately will that is ultimately what this fight will be remembered for is the fan mat incident. Even though this was another terrific fight and a terrific effort by Holyfield in winning and beating a guy that's 30 pounds heavier than him. So in the first fight, they thought he was done. And then the second fight, they proved that he didn't. And he became only the fourth man in history besides Ali, Floyd Patterson. And I forgot who else, but... He became only the fourth man in history to to regain his title after losing it. For the third fight, Holyfield had better years. He lost to Michael Moore, had a tough fight against Ray Mercer, who wasn't the greatest heavyweight of that era, but a really good heavyweight. In fact, I made an underappreciated fighters about Ray Mercer, but still... He hadn't had the best time. He only fought once in 1994. And this was his only fight. Since. Since winning the 12 round unanimous decision. Against Ray Mercer. He actually was the first man to drop. To drop Ray Mercer. And in the third fight against Riddick Bowe. He became the first man. To drop. Riddick Bo, he dropped him in the sixth round, and the third one, the third fight is really strange. I mean, Holyfield had heart troubles before this, and that's all the commentators were talking about his heart troubles, his heart troubles. And I saw a really close fight up to the fifth round, where they were going back and forth, and all George Foreman was talking about was Holyfield's heart problems. That's all he was talking about during this fight, and it was a close fight throughout the fight and that's what pisses me off about the third fight and kind of ruins the trilogy as a whole because you didn't want to give Holyfield credit for taking this fight and in return you're kind of taking away off Riddick Bowe's greatest victory of his career stopping Evander Holyfield which only has happened twice in his career and once to an ATG in James Tony. so the third fight, it was an exciting fight. They did go back and forth. But George Foreman freaking ruins that. And he took credit from Riddick Bowe. And he took credit from Holyfield's effort. Terrible commentary. I love George Foreman. But he kind of ruined the third fight. Even though it was a really good fight. Not as good as the first two. But very exciting nonetheless. And it's kind of sad that... That... This was the last chapter because that's all that everybody's going to talk about is George Foreman. And that's all I've heard. It was a beautiful performance by Riddick Bowe. But every, everything anybody's going to talk about is that Holyfield had heart tr- troubles and that George Foreman's commentary was terrible. Everybody brings it up when discussing this. So Riddick Bowe goes on and really goes on to... The only thing he did after this was fight for those two disqualification wins against uh, Andrew Galata. And he retired after the second Galata fight and he didn't come back until 2007. I mean 2004. And he only had three fights after the two Galata fights. So, hey, he, he got into the Hall of Fame last year. But I gotta ask, does he really deserve it? Does this trilogy really merit his Hall of Fame induction? I'm leaning towards no. I don't think that he deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. But leave me your thoughts. We all know Holyfield is a legendary fighter. And he went on to become a five-time world heavyweight champion of the world. The only five-time heavyweight champion to ever exist. So we all know about Holyfield. But tell me, does this trilogy, as great as it was, really good, really entertaining, does it merit Riddick Bo going into the Hall of Fame? Thanks everybody for watching and that's what's up.